So we're here to talk about taking your turn because this is a problem in the tabletop industry. Everyone thinks they're cute going up to the tabletop library five minutes before they're going to kick us all out and holding a copy of Twilight Imperium and be like, can I check this out? And every enforcer has to smile and say, no one's ever made that joke before. If you go to any board game online community and you look at the top recurring discussions that keep coming up over and over and over again, my friend plays slow, the game takes too long, is like the top five easily. So we're like, hey, why don't we just do a panel on all those top things? Oh, how about long games? All right, we're good. Yep. Let's do it. Because that is unacceptable. So No one's got time for that if you're an adult. I mean, when I was in college, I already didn't have time for that. So when we play a game like Puerto Rico, we play it real fast. And I feel like now that we're older, now that there's a lot more games, you want to play a lot of games. So you don't want to waste all your time on just one game, especially when that one game eats four hours of your very limited packs. You can only fit so many games into packs. And humans have been doing this for a long time. Talk about chess. Chess, the whole idea of moving a pawn two spaces, that was a rule that was added to make chess go faster because pawn pushing is pointless and boring and meaningless. It was just busy work. That's just like building your zerglings well, early in the game. Now people don't even know that in original chess you would just start by moving pawns one, 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 right? People don't know that that was a change. It was so long ago. Backgammon had similar changes. Backgammon used to be three times longer and they cut out most of the Yeah, game. if you play backgammon in certain countries, the rules, every piece starts off the board. You get to get all the pieces on the board, then all the pieces around, then all the pieces off again. Right? The normal way most people play where the pieces are like set up originally is like they just decided, well, that's like the most interesting starting arrangement, so we'll just always do it that way so the game doesn't take forever. So they took the grind out of chess. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> but another thing, we in particular, we don't just want people to take their turn. We want people to fucking take their turn. We go fast. Puerto Rico, we'll knock that game out in 30 minutes. Everdell, 45 minutes. I always have a hard time when people are like, well, how long is that game, right? It's like, I can't tell you how long the game is because, you know, I, maybe I played it with someone who was slow, but maybe I played it with my friends and it was like lightning. And if I tell you the game is 20 minutes and it takes you two hours... Right? You're going to think I lied. It's not yep. Right. But we, we're those people. So if you don't like to try to win and take your turn and go fast, one, you would hate us. And two, never sit at a table with us because we will all hate each other. So at the same time, we also like train games. Train games take between four and infinity hours to play. <laughs> and we spent at PAX West. We got kicked out of tabletop because uh, we went over time and the enforcers had to like kick us out well, playing this train game that took it, too long. This is the eternal struggle, right? It's like you don't want to spend too much time on a game, but there's a lot of games that are like good and can't be shorter. Like part of the appeal is that they're long. It's like, oh, that's such an amazing gaming experience. Four hours of intense awesomeness, <laughs> right? But when can you actually play that? It's, you know... So that's the battle that's going on. So let's start about a, a concept that I think we all need to internalize. This is something that is starting to be talked about more in the games industry like and among game players. Uh, I bought a lot of stock images for this. You're going to see a lot of like really boring white people looking at each other. If you go to Adobe Stock and type anything, you will see a thousand white hands pointing at a generic thing. <laughs> let's talk about the fun economy. If a game is fun, but it takes a long time, it's not that good. Or at least it has a low fun economy, like a car has a low fuel economy. So uh, while there are games that take a long time and might be worth it to you, if you can find a game that is a certain amount of fun, but takes like 10 or 20 or 30 minutes to play, that game is probably objectively better as a game and you should seek those games out. You should reward the games that trust you and respect you enough to not waste your time. I was getting this argument a lot with people who are like, you know, especially like TV shows or something, right? And they'd be like, oh, you got to watch this TV show. It's great, but it doesn't get great to like episode 10. That may be true. It may become the most amazing TV show if I can slog through to episode 10. But you know what? There's like a billion TV shows on Earth. There's a whole bunch that are good from episode one. If I just stick to those, I'll die before I see all those. I'm not even bothering with one that doesn't get good till episode 10, right? No matter how good it gets. Yep, I was watching all the Sailor Moon. Board game. All the Sailor Moon, Video and someone's like, oh, in this one season, there's like eight episodes. You just gotta, you gotta watch them, but they suck, so watch them on Fast Forward. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't know, so, <laughs> so let's look at some examples and sort of work through this. So Deep Sea Adventure is pretty fun. Like, it's an okay fun game. It's not a great game. It's not that fun. But it's pretty fun. But it's not unfun. Yeah. You're a bunch you of jerks. Drowning your friend. I've had a lot of fun drowning my friends. Like, yeah, you drowned. Yes. Yeah, you're a bunch of jerks in a submarine sharing oxygen trying to steal treasure. So it's not that fun, but it's pretty fun. 
but it takes like five minutes to play. It takes like 30 seconds to teach. Right, not just that, there's also the setup time, right? You have setup, learn, play. You can bust this game out while you're waiting for this panel to start. So I would say this is an objectively good game because you get one unit of fun in almost no amount of time. That's a huge fun economy. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, one of those train games, the easiest one, 1846, The Race for the Midwest, which I love, and that game is exactly like the way it looks on that slide there. <laughs> it is objectively more fun. That board doesn't even need pieces up. No. <laughs> it, is, it is more fun, meaning there is more to do. There are more decisions, more interactions. There's a lot more meat on that plate, but it takes a long time Like, to if you play. play this game, like, we can play maybe this game two or three times in one PAX day, and that's about it. Yeah. Right? And we're fast. We now, think no, we're fast. Now, this is not a better or worse game than this game, because this provides more fun, and it provides different fun. It's fun you can't get in a game that's that short. So we can't just say a game is better if it's shorter. We really have to think about what does it bring to the table. Get it? Bring to the table? Uh-huh. So what about Monopoly? <laughs> Monopoly is long, and it's never fun. It's Monop really fun in like the first two seconds, and then it gets unfun quick. Well, here's the point. Monopoly has some fun aspects. There's a little bit of fun in there. Like, you can squeeze this tiny little drop of fun out of Monopoly. It is there. But Monopoly takes between 4 and 40 hours to win. And even worse, most Americans add rules to make it take even longer. I even heard some security guards talking, right? Because I guess they're not the security guards at this con today, like yesterday. They're not obviously deep in the board gaming uh, world, at least those ones weren't, right? And they were talking, but they knew this was a board game con, so I must have told them. And they were talking about board games. They're like, oh, remember Trouble? Oh, I remember Sorry, and someone was like, oh man, I love Monopoly, I just never finish it. Even can, normal, non-nerdy people are not finishing Monopoly. We're gonna, knows. we're gonna talk in a bit about like mechanically why Monopoly in games like it takes so long, but think of Monopoly like fast food. Like, you don't want to eat a McDonald's burger. Like, you don't want to, but sometimes Some this weird like reptilian part of your brain says, yo, go eat one of those. And you think, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna eat one of those. And you regret it, but for that brief moment it was fun. <laughs> fun can mean different things. This is why this is a hard topic to talk about. Wizard's a pretty good game. It's a trick-taking game. We really like it. We taught it on Friday. Yeah, but it's only okay fun. Like, it's an okay fun trick-taking game, and it takes a while to play, but because it's a trick-taking card game, it's a game where you can socialize during the entirety of the game. So while the game isn't that good, and the game takes longer than it would if we just focused on playing the game, the socialization and the downtime within the game is why we play the game. Your parents in Michigan play Euchre because they want to hang out with each other, not because they like Euchre that much. No, but one, if one of them does care about Euchre that much and the other ones don't, you have a little problem. Right? Yep. And there's also this point about there's different kinds of fun. There's things that, it, like, a game might actually take a really long time, but if you don't feel like it took a long time, if you're enjoying yourself the whole time, even though the game like is taking four hours, maybe that's okay. Maybe you're still getting something out of it. Yeah, there's actually a lot of different, it, a lot of this depends on the game design, right? So I always, when Ticket to Ride came out, I sort of had like this revelation. It's like, you know, Ticket to Ride, it's not a super fast game, but you're never bored playing Ticket to Ride because on your turn, you do this much stuff, right? So it's like, bam, 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 bam. Everyone's taking really short turns. So you never feel like you're waiting around for anything. Right? Other games will be like, you take your turn, and during my and during your turn, I can't do anything. I just sit around waiting. Like, say, Root, Root is an amazing game, but if you're playing four-player Root, you sit there and wait for three people to do their turn while you do nothing except think. And if you've already thought about your next turn, you do nothing and wait and wait and wait and wait, and then it's your turn. So it can feel long if people are slow, right? The best is simultaneous turns or do stuff during other people's turns. The game never feels slow. And even if the game takes five hours, you might be like, oh man, that was a short game. Let's play again. And it's like, dude, that took five hours. It just didn't feel like five hours because you're always doing stuff all yep. the time. So Root is a pretty good example of a really good sweet spot to be in because Root takes a while. Root's not a super short game. It is for us. And we'll talk about how to make it like that for you too. But Root is really fun for what it is, because Root is a very elegant game. Root has condensed the kinds of mechanics that are in super serious Grognard war games, and made them with cute animals, and made the game still long, but not too long. It doesn't overstay its welcome. So Root is like an example of the kind of sweet spot you want to shoot for. Root is brilliant game design because of that and that. Not that alone, but that is a big part of why Root is so popular. As opposed to, say, some Grognard war game. I don't even know what game that is. I just searched for, quote, some Grognard war game on Google Images. 
I assume with, all of them are, are advanced squad leader. Like, that's the one I know that has, like, a giant binder. They're all that same game. Yeah. <laughs> now, whatever this game is, is more fun than Roots. Now, maybe it's fun in the Dwarf Fortress way, but there's more going on in this game. You can get more out of this game than you can get out well, of this game. Fun for some people. You can get something out of it. You can squeeze something out of that thing. But it takes a long time, and you have to decide if that's worth the investment. And then if you bust out the advanced rules, you're in even deeper trouble. <laughs> oh, it's the, the campaign for Africa. This game is a joke. You're not supposed to play it. You can play it, kind of like Hall. There's an RPG called Human Occupied Landfill. The rule book is just a joke. Like, you're not actually supposed to play the game. Sometimes people try to play it. This game will take you your entire life to play. It's down to the level of individual troops in the entire North African campaign of World War II. It might take longer than the actual campaign for North Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's talk about mechanics now. This people, when we give talks, we usually talk about, like, deep in mechanics. And when it comes to games taking too long, there are only two things we can blame. We can either blame the players, or we can blame the game. Most people tend to blame the players first, right? If you look online, it's always like, kick that guy out of your, kick that guy out of your game group, he's slow, or talk to them, or make them take their turn. We blame the game first. Yep, the game is number one blame. Not that the player is no blame. Game is blamed first. Yep, and even worse, some things could make a game go long if players act a certain way. So now it's almost like a risk. This game is four minutes, or if your friend Scott plays, 400 minutes. Right, like, <laughs> like even if we, who think we're fast at games, play Monopoly, it will take long. We have to blame the game. Even if people who are usually slow at games play Deep Sea Adventure, it will be quick 99% of the time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Monopoly. The problem with Monopoly is both the players in the game, which is primarily the game, one of the problems with Monopoly is that the mechanics keep injecting resources. You keep going around the board, you keep getting money. It keeps injecting resources. It doesn't take the resources away at the same rate, so there's no mechanic that forces the game to end. The game's economy doesn't have something that says, this is the last turn, you cannot win, the game is over. It's not like you're paying a tax every time you go around. Right, the technical end game condition for Monopoly is when everyone's bankrupt except one person, right? But there's nothing pulling people towards bankruptcy. It's like, it's really, it takes a long time for people to actually go bankrupt. You might be completely mathematically eliminated, right? There's no way you can win or your probability of winning is so small. But for that probability to actually reach zero, like you cannot win, takes forever. So you're forced to play the game even though you can't win the game anymore. And that's why you're upset. If you still had a chance to win, then you wouldn't be so upset even if you were sitting there for a long time going around and around. Well, it's like, oh, there's things I can do. I could come back. I could, right? There's nothing you can do. You've lost. Well, you still have to keep going. You technically have a chance. Cause theoretically, tiny, you, could, tiny you could never land on anything and keep going around and around. It's more like football. The game isn't actually technically over. This is the win percentages of some, like, Seahawks game against the Rams a while ago, like 2015. It's the percentage chance each team has to win the game at any point until the end. The game isn't over until it's over. The game ends at the moment no player can affect the game any further. Monopoly actually has a lot of mechanics that force the game to keep going, even though, while someone technically could win, the chance is so low it's effectively zero. But before we can really talk about these two, like this graph and Monopoly in detail, we have to quote a book. We gotta talk about Your some favorite research. book ever. Characteristics of Games was written by uh, someone you might know, Richard Garfield. If you read this book, you won't have to come to any panel we've done ever. We borrow a lot from this book. This is a sort of foundational text of tabletop game design and game design in general. But he has this concept in the book of the idea of bushiness. A game's bushiness, he doesn't like to use like a very defined definition because nerds like us and you, get like to, we like to use pedantic definitions to fight with so each other over nothing. Mouth and just get the idea. Right. A game is bushy if you have a lot of options and a lot of things you can interact with. And a game is sparse if you don't have a lot of options. You don't have a lot of things to interact with. So this concept of bushiness is how we're going to evaluate why some of these games go on too long. So look back at American football or ice hockey, any sports. You have the same options in the beginning of a football game as you have in the end of a football game. If you use your timeouts, maybe you have one less option. At the very end of a game, you have a few more options because there are some options that are stupid in the beginning of a football game that make sense if you're losing at the end of a football like game. Like you wouldn't do an onside kick unless you had to. Then you would. Ice hockey, the option of pull your goalie appears at the end of the game. You could technically do it in the beginning. That, that would, would be, be stupid. stupid. 
So the game has the same number of decisions. Do I shoot the puck or pass the puck throughout the entire game? Do I change lines now? You know, whatever. Look at Monopoly. You have decisions to make in the game. Like buy do, the property, don't buy the property. Do I buy bid houses, on this property? Don't buy houses. How, how many much houses do I buy? Where do I buy the house? How much do I bid? Should I cheat? Do I trick? Do I bring the dice? <laughs> should I flip the table? Should but, I pay fifty dollars to get out of jail, or should I roll the dice and try to get doubles to get out of jail free? Now, there's not so that. Do I get out of jail free card? There's not that many decisions, but there are decisions to make. There's things the player can do to impact the game. Up until that point, where one or two players have all the money and all the properties and everyone else has nothing, then you cannot, nothing you do in the game can affect the outcome of the game. You're just rolling the dice forever and ever until you see who wins. You're finding out who wins, like Candyland. At the beginning of Candyland, there's no decisions in Candyland. You are literally just finding out who won. And to find out who won game. That is the Valley of Despair. That is why Monopoly feels a little fun. You're having fun until the fun runs out and then you're trapped. I think the game, I think what they should do is you just play Monopoly and said the game is over as soon as the last property is purchased or as soon as there are three or less unpurchased properties. Whoever has the most money wins, plus the value of your property in the hotel. No, the game is over. Just open the box, look at the contents, remember like when you were a kid playing Monopoly, close the box, put it away. That is how you win Monopoly. <laughs> So let's talk about a, a, like a tabletop miniatures fighting elimination war game. Warhammer, Battletech. Or uh, chess. Yeah, chess too. <laughs> chess and games like it, the bushiness decreases in a linear fashion over time as pieces get eliminated. You all, decisions you make earlier actually do matter more mathematically. Humans can't <coughs> engage with the game on that level. Only AIs can. As the game goes on and you get closer to the known solutions to chess, you have fewer decisions, but they matter a lot more. So the bushiness goes down, so as you have to think harder about your decisions, you have fewer decisions to make. That is why chess actually usually does end. There's a reason why chess actually doesn't end now, and we have this problem with stalemates and draws, but that is way too much to talk about in this panel. But the bushiness decreases. Chess would never end if that was not true. Most tabletop games follow this basic arc. You have some options. You, you like, right, buy some mines. At the base start of the game, you don't have a lot of resources. Yep. There's only so many things you can do, right? Even if there's like 20 different buildings to buy, well, you can only afford like three, right? So you're going down one of these few roads at the beginning, then suddenly you get more resources. So you can buy all sorts of stuff, right? You're loading up your board, building some giant engine or something. Then towards the end of the game, it's like, well, I'm only looking for victory points, and there's only a few ways for me to squeeze out victory points, like those three big score things. I'll go yep. for those, right? It comes back down, and the game's over. So this is the classic game arc. This is kind of what you're looking for. This little bit at the end can usually be a problem. You know at the end of a game of like Power Grid or any of these like Euro games, you're like kind of done, you know you're not gonna win, and it takes like one more round before the game's over. That's not too bad, but there's ways to get rid of that. So remember this definition. Remember this concept of bushiness because I want to talk about a game called Everdell. Everdell's a really good game. I can crank out a game of Everdell in like 45 minutes, but Everdell, the bushiness of Everdell increases as the game goes on. You don't just get more powerful things as the game goes on. You get access to different things, lots of different things. You have so many more decisions to make in the last third of that game. You make more decisions in the last round of this game than in the entire two first phases of the game combined. That is a problem because the more decisions you have to make that are viable, the more you have to think about them, the more you have to look at all the cards, try to figure out a path through the game. You cannot have a lot of bushiness in the end of a game if you want it to end. I'm just going to leave Everdell out because Everdell does something else that's actually a problem. And Wingspan does this too, but it's not as much of a problem. Everdell has a lot of bits to interact with. A ton of things. And they all do different things. They're all unique. So if you actually want to be good at Everdell, you have to memorize all of those, or you have to look at the entire board and like look at everyone else's boards and look at everything throughout the entire game to make sure you are doing the optimal path. That'll make the game take a long time, but I mostly blame the players for that because you could just not worry about that and just enjoy the game and it'll be done. Wingspan, this isn't actually much of a problem. Wingspan has a huge number of cards that are unique. In fact, every card in Wingspan is unique. Every bird is unique and has a unique power in this game. But the powers all do kind of the same types of things, so you can predict what they could do. With Everdell, I can't really predict what they could do without reading them, so if I don't look at every bird every round and read all the text, I'll still do okay at Wingspan. It still makes the game take more time, but it doesn't make the game take as much time 
as Everdell. Right. Also, in Wingspan, even though there's a huge deck of unique birds, you only have to worry about the ones that have actually appeared in the game. You're not going to use all those cards every game. You only have to use the ones that have been drawn. So just read the ones that have been drawn and ignore what could possibly come out of the deck. It's not worth your time. Yep. And because they do the same kinds of things, like uh, draw two ore versus draw three ore versus draw one ore and one sheep, like that kind of stuff, if they're consistent in what they do, it's easier to predict what cards might come later without having to worry about them that Right, much. if there's some crazy card that's like, you know, get 100 eggs, it's like, well, now I have to worry. What if the card, get 100 eggs card shows up? I have to be ready. <laughs> that's a lot of eggs. Yeah. Some games, the cards are unique and you can't predict what they do. Everdell has that problem. That is a recipe for a game going a long time, but that can be mitigated by a concept of heuristics that we'll talk about in a minute. This is this World War II simulation game called Quartermaster General. It has a whole bunch of unique cards that are super unique, like, oh, troops appear in this country right now if this occurred previously. Ridiculous crap. These, you have to memorize, it's the same problem as Everdell, unless you know a little bit about World War II history, if you have this external context, these cards are all really predictable. You know what kinds of things could happen in World War II. So outside information or heuristics around that information can make the game take less time. So you can either make the cards predictable or give people a what way... What if someone knows a lot about birds? Well, the, they know what kind of cards are going to show up in Ah, oh, but the knowledge of birds is not tied to what the cards do. How do you know? You don't know anything about birds. I've read those cards. There's no way. This game is about, like, your eggs are just a resource. I bet the birds game. that have more eggs are birds that lay more eggs. Uh, in the real world. But there's an even distribution of the number of egg bird types. I, you know, I don't know. Freaking Audubon over here. <laughs> <laughs> so we can blame the medium in some cases. Tabletop does not have a computer to do all the work for you. Sometimes there's busy work. You gotta fill in every one of those little dots if someone shoots you with a small laser. Yep, it's like, yeah, if you play Battletech with a computer, right, you can play the exact same game and you don't have to roll 2d6, check a chart, roll 2d6, check a chart, roll 2d6, just the, even, not the decision making, but just the act of doing the game, doing the busy work to make the game happen, to figure out the result of your decision, could take a few minutes. If you have a computer, you could literally say, I fire my small laser at the head and it says, not only did you hit, their head exploded, they're dead, their mech exploded, it's like an instant, right? So not being a computer as a human being just makes board games slow sometimes. Now, we don't blame the medium entirely because busy work in a game serves valuable purposes. It gives people time to cool down. It's it fun to fill in bubbles on a mech. Oh, I love filling in these bubbles. Oh, this man, is my mech. <laughs> <laughs> but it also gives you time to like internalize mechanics, internalize events that happen in the game, think about the score. There's a lot of reasons why busy work is both a positive and a negative aspect of tabletop gaming. But if a game has poorly designed busy work, you're going to spend a lot of time dealing with it. When we play 1846, we need an Excel spreadsheet to figure out the dividends toward the end of the game, or it takes a while. Some games have this political... Political in games means something different from what you're thinking right now. But games that have a stop the winner mechanic, meaning there's not much to do in the game, but eventually someone's looks, someone looks like they're about to win, and then everyone has to stop them from winning. Then someone else looks like they're about to win, and everyone has to stop them from winning. That is why Munchkin never ends and is a terrible game. <laughs> because there is nothing to make the game end. It's terrible for a lot of other reasons, too. It's just, bad. it's just bad in general. But I want you to look at this graph, because if you understand why, the thing that happens in Munchkin applies to all games. Because all games that have more than two players and are not just races, where you don't interact with each other, they end up being political. This is a return on skill. So this is how much, as I put more skill into the game, how much return do I get on that skill? I, in blackjack, I'm counting cards. In chess, I'm doing strategies. But with a game like Munchkin, eventually you're doing everything you can. There is no smarter decision you could possibly make. Meaning politics is all that's left. And politics is, I vote who wins. I don't want Scott to win because fuck Scott. So I attack Scott. <laughs> I played like this magic conspiracy draft the other day. I haven't played magic in 25 years. It was a vote who wins game pretty much, right? We might, you're doing all this fancy stuff with creatures and everything. We could have just said, all right, we're going to do a secret ballot and vote who wins. And it's the same exact game, mathematically speaking. Yep. <laughs> with a little bit of luck. Maybe one person luckily gets an extra vote, or maybe with their skill they get an extra vote or something like that. But it's fundamentally vote who wins. So a measure of a game might be, how far out does this bubble go before it hits politics? But all multiplayer games are political once everyone is good at them. And you gotta be ready for that, you gotta think about that. 
Sometimes a game lets you calculate things that are important, but doesn't make it that easy to calculate them. And your friend Scott, a different Scott, not me. The other will sit one. there He's here somewhere. and He's calculate different. everything on their turn. Every turn. Right, there's a famous phrase analysis paralysis that people probably have in their heads before they come to this panel and we're surprised it took us 25 minutes to say it. <laughs> right, this game is the analysis paralysis game. If you sit there and you calculate the results of every possible move you could make on your turn, you will, if you're not wrong, make the optimal move in this game and have the highest chance of it. Oh, oh it's Scott. Scott Johnson! There he is! <laughs> <laughs> Scott, Scott Johnson, everybody! <laughs> oh, did you bring like King Puffs to me or something? No. no, full disclosure, he is undefeated at this game as far as I can tell. That's right. Yeah, as far as I'm aware. But yeah, if you calculate everything, you will win this game unless someone else does the same thing, then it will come down to luck. Now again, most games have this kind of problem, but you can design games to make it easy to calculate the things that people will want to calculate. Like put board aids, there's ways to make it so that someone who's bad at math or someone who's going to spend their time figuring this out can do it more quickly. But I mostly blame the players because if you're going to be that kind of person who's going to like calculate everything, you need to get faster at calculation. So the game and the player have to make changes. Avoid games that make, like, you, if you need to know a number in a game and that number is really hard to calculate, the game is just who is better at calculating that number, maybe play a better game. But if you can get better at calculating those numbers, you can be better than all your friends at those kinds of games. Or at least faster. Yeah. Faster will usually mean better for reasons we'll talk about later. Alright, some games... This is a different train game, but it doesn't look like a train game, but it's in space. This is the one that got us kicked out of uh, PAX West tabletop when they closed at midnight, because it's a real fun train game, we're really liking it, but there's a round where you have to calculate how much money your space trains make. Well, how much, how much ore they make when they go around space mining asteroids. Yeah, you, you do a thing. Right. The problem with the thing is that it takes a while to do the thing. It's a complicated process to calculate and do. And then another player has to do the same thing on the same board. They can't even start thinking about what they're going to do until you're done because everything you do affects what they might do. Right. Which ores did you mine on your turn? Okay, well, I have to get the best score I can get from what's left. And then the, way, so the third person is waiting for two people to do this. Right? And it takes forever. In the other train game we showed earlier, it doesn't change too much from round to round, right? It's like, well, last turn, my train could get $80. And this turn, one extra piece of track was built, so now I can get $90, right? It's like, in this game, it's like everything changes every round. You have to recalculate everything from scratch every time. You're spending most of your time calculating that result, not most of the time during the actual parts where you're playing the game, buying and selling stocks, building space trains, you know, putting out asteroid tokens. So it's like the small part. And then it's calculate, small calculate. So watch out for that perfect storm of a game where the game state changes radically based on player actions, coupled with players have to take a lot of actions on their turn before another player can act. If the game state changes radically, but you take a really quick action and you keep going around taking actions, that's fine. But if the game changes a lot and you spend 10 minutes doing your turn, the game will take 10 minutes times number of turns times number of players, Twilight Imperium happens. <laughs> Unbounded bargaining. <laughs> Some games have bounded bargaining, rules around bargaining. Bonanza, that bean game, is like a great example of a good game. It might still be the best bargaining game there is. I like Doom, but if a game has situations where you have to bargain with people and barter, and there are no mechanics to force that shit to stop when it's done, someone's gonna keep trying to make deals and make the game take forever. People are gonna ham and haw. You have to have game mechanic incentives to make bartering end or make bartering finish with some sort of deal. Radical asymmetry. Vast has this problem. Dune also has this problem. If the game is radically asymmetric, that's really bothering me. Yeah, it was me. bothering me too. Why did you move it earlier? Just slide that over the side. <laughs> there we go. Anything, but now you've got this extra. It's going away. I got rid of it. I took care of it for you. I can still see it. <laughs> I'm going to Photoshop that out before we... So, Vast and Dune are crazily asymmetric. Like, if I play the Harkonnen in Dune, I have completely different rules about core mechanics of the game from everyone else. Vast, I actually have a different game board. I, like, have different actions I can take. One person's playing, like, a knight that's fighting a dragon. One person's playing the dragon. One person's playing the cave they're fighting in. <laughs> that's awesome, right? That is awesome. But it means that to play the game, you need to know how to play all those different games. 
And if you're going to teach the game, you need to know how all those parts work. Right. So even if playing the game goes fast because everyone is mastered and understands all the rules, teaching the game is slow, setting the game up is slow, and no matter how fast you are, right, it's easy when a game, if everyone's doing generally the same thing, you look around the board, you can sort of tell what everyone is doing and sort of what they can do to figure out what you're gonna do. If everyone's completely wildly different, you need to spend, no matter how smart you are, unless you're, I don't know, maybe some super genius, unless yeah. I can, you gotta look at each player and completely change your mindset, right? It's like, all right, what's that player up to? Oh, they're doing this, all right, all right what's that player up to? change my own, right? reset everything, right? And it's very, very difficult and time consuming to then make the decision of what I'm going to do on my turn with my completely different game. Now, while it's true that this kind of mechanic objectively makes the game take longer, there's no way around that, it also provides, think back to the beginning, a unique kind of fun you can't get from other kinds of games. That's why I also blame the players. If you want to play really asymmetric games like Root, or Vast, or Dune, you have the responsibility to learn the game fully. Read the rules yourself and learn it before you play, maybe even refuse to play it with people who haven't done the same. Because you can play Dune and Vast really quick if everyone actually knows all the rules. I think that's the thing that, you know, doesn't happen too often, right? People tend to, you know, they learn a game, they teach it to some people, and unless you, you keep playing it with those same people over and over and over and over and you all master it, well then you can play fast. But if you keep having a new person every time, even one new person makes the whole game slow. Right? No matter how smart they are, even if it's the fastest, best, most genius player in the world, right? They're going to be slow the first time they play any game. All right. If a game has, and Everdell has this problem too, not to get back to Everdell, if a game has a lot of systems and a lot of things to interact with, but they either don't work the same way that those systems work in most other games, or if they aren't consistent with each other. Like, if you interact with this area, it's majority of pieces takes the Bathmadad. But if you mess with this thing, it's whoever has the least takes the Bathmadad. When the mechanics are inconsistent, then you're going to have to keep context switching depending on what you're interacting with. Everdell has a really bad example of this. Everdell is mostly non-interactive. You only interact with players because you built something they wanted. You got in their way. But there's a few cards that interact with other players and steal stuff from them. The fact that those exist means everyone has to worry about them for the entire game because they're inconsistent with the rest of the game. It's sort of like how when you play Dominion, if there's any curses in any of the ten cards, you play completely differently than if there are no curses. <laughs> right? It's a completely different game. If there's one witch, that's it. Whole, whole different Dominion. Yep. Uh, a big example of this, too, is you'll find games will just take a thing that everyone knows, like a draft. Or, I don't know, like a mechanic, like a draft. A draft is a good example. But they'll do the draft weird. If they do the draft weird, your players are going to keep messing it up because they've done drafts before. You're going to have problems. You're going to have to keep, like, right. relearning draft. the game. Take a card, pass to the left. But this game, on my game, we have to take a card, pass to the right, then take two, pass mm -hmm. to the left, and take three, and pass it across. And it's like, well, if you do a weird thing like that, people aren't going to remember it because it's different from what they're used to. Take one, pass to the left. So if you're doing a weird thing with a mechanic that is common to many games, that better be the focus of your game. Your game is about that draft. That is the, the main feature of your game is this funky draft. Then it's okay. But all the mechanics that are not the main feature of your game, there's some like sideshow, they're just there to support the main feature. You need to do those in the standard way that every other game does them so that people are used to it and don't need to think too hard about it if they're gamers who know what's up. Yep, if you're a game designer, stand on the shoulders of giants. There's a reason why the concept of taking a card and turning it 90 degrees to, to show that you've used it is a really widespread mechanic because that is a really good, consistent mechanic. Don't make a weird one looking at you, Chuddick where you have to like rotate it all the way around and then splay it. So we're gonna get into heuristics in a second, it's a good segue, but really abstract games have a problem. Like, let's look at chess first. Chess is an abstract game, but ostensibly it's two armies fighting. There's like knights and stuff trying to kill the king. So if you sit to someone down who's never played chess before and say, your job is to kill that king, they'll naturally think, okay, I want to move my dudes toward that king so I can kill him. Yeah, There's even a, the most beginner player has some idea of what to do and that will help them make decisions faster and play faster. Hockey, take this biscuit and get it into that basket over there. <laughs> right. But go, all right, 
Uh, yes, if you play Go and you know how Go works, Go is like a really deep, Capture rich, some stones, amazing game, them, right? It's like okay, but, but what you try to surround stones by going like this, you'll have a very bad time. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the real world things you might think would make sense on a Go board if you've never played Go are terrible ideas. So we're going to spend the rest of this panel. <laughs> we're going to teach all of you how to play fast, but I got to warn you: if you do the things we're about to tell you, you're going to hate. All of your friends. Like, so I hope I, all your friends are here. Or you make them watch this on YouTube. Or you're I, watching on YouTube and not make your friends watch on YouTube. It's like a share button <laughs> somewhere, right? Yeah, and that guy. Speed it up, dude. So, <laughs> number one, you have to recognize arbitrary decisions. If decision A and decision B are effectively the same, you need to recognize that shit and just pick right. Just like, don't worry about it. I see a lot of players I've played with hand and haw and spend time thinking and deciding between two options that are identical. There's no, just oh, pick one randomly. Do I pick paper? I don't know, but scissors feel pretty good. Maybe, no, I don't know. Paper, it's I think just the best paper, strategy is scissors. If you can't pick one and they're equal, randomly pick is the best move. Oh yeah, well, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Yeah. So I'm gonna give you an example. You don't even need to know the rules to this game. All you need to know is this game is called Hiroshima Hex, and to start the game, you need to put your starting tile somewhere on the board. How many unique decisions do I have? How many do you think there is one decision? Two, three options, four options, five off, good lord, okay, so. There are four options. There are only four options, because it's a symmetric board. Every other place you could go is a copy, a functional equivalent of some other thing on that board. So if you sit there trying to decide between one of the twos and one of the other twos, it's a non-decision. They're the identical thing. Look for symmetry in games and you can eliminate decisions. And honestly, we're humans. One of the things that makes humans like crazy good at stuff and the reason why AI is not beating us at most things, humans are really good at naturally figuring out what is a bad idea. We're not good at figuring out what a good idea is, but like I could do, if I'm playing like run the panel of the game, I could stab myself in the eye with this. I could get naked. I could jump off this. Those are all options, but I know they're bad ideas just naturally. And the really hard problem is you got several good ideas. Which one's the best idea? That's the hard, that's the hardest level of all. All right, say so I went there. Now how many options do I have if I'm the next player and I have to put something on this board? Three. Three. All right, they're learning. Yeah. You're the first audience who has ever gotten that right. <laughs> Thank you, Pax. First time we've done this panel ever. And this keeps going. <laughs> you ruined it for them. They were feeling good. They were feeling confident. Even when the game gets less symmetric, you can still do this. Even here, look, you think I have all these options? No, almost half of them are still arbitrary. They're still functionally equivalent. You can always find symmetries in games. So... These are stolen from other panels we've done on how to be good at games, but it just so happens that a lot of the ways to be good are also ways to be fast. We're not going to go too deep into heuristics, but heuristics are really important, and we're going to talk about why they're important. This is how you get both good at games and fast at games. We're not going to talk about how they make you good because that's a whole other talk, but heuristics very simply are you have a rule that is not a full simulation of the thing that helps you decide what to do about the thing. If I take this clicker and just huck it at one of you, you'll probably be able to catch it. And the reason for that is that you can't do like quadratic equations and ballistic trajectories. Right, you're not your sitting there calculating the physics of, oh, he threw it with these many joules of, or newtons of force <laughs> at this angle with this arm speed. It's going to go there and it's going to land in this spot. And then by the time you've thought that, the, this hit you in the face, right? Yep. Yeah. Right. Humans. So how the hell do you catch it? You have another method of getting close enough to the right answer very, very quickly, so fast that you can catch something being thrown at you like 100 miles an hour if a pitcher throws a ball at the catcher. Yep, and the rule's really simple. It's something humans naturally do. We instinctually will look up at an object that's flying toward us, and now we can move our body forward and backward without changing the angle of our view, and the thing will naturally fall into our hands. You that's don't even really know you're doing that. It's subconscious. But it's not a perfect rule, because if I huck this at someone over there, none of you can figure out who I hucked it to until they catch it. You can only calculate this if it's coming directly at you. It's not a perfect simulation, but it's good enough to win a game of football. Unless you're the Detroit Lions. <laughs> you're again, it's not doing too much. Oh, we're in Philly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. So, Scott's from New York, and he really hates Philadelphia. Really I'm sorry. Philadelphia. Well, <laughs> That's the way it should be. 
It would be bad if you liked us, right? Yeah, you want to be like Boston, we're like weirdly mutual, like the cat, Washington, we like mutually respect each other in a weird way. No, that's no fun. We gotta fight. <laughs> there are two kinds of heuristics. Positional heuristics are how you know how well you're doing in a game. Mm. And they get complex because the blue shell means that whoever's in first place isn't actually in first place. Let's look at a tabletop example. In Settlers, really easy to know how well you're doing. How many points do you have? How many places could you still build a place or upgrade to a city? And could you get longest road or largest army? It's really easy to figure out who's really winning a game. If you figure out a simple way to calculate that, you're not going to waste your time calculating that over and over again every time you play a turn. Directional heuristics are how you decide what to do next. These are the ones that help you go fast. Do I take the safe bridge or the really dodgy looking bridge with snakes? Are those snakes? Snakes. Yeah, Whoa, snakes. all these years I never noticed those were snakes. What did you, <laughs> you think they were? I never even looked at it. I thought they were just like scepters with stuff wrapped like rope around them or something. For example, in card games, in trick taking games, poker, hearts, or anything, you could count every single card someone played for the entire game and keep that in your head and calculate odds. Very few humans are capable of doing that. And even if you are capable, that sucks. That is not fun to do. And if you try to do it, you're going to spend a lot of time keeping your mental state consistent. So use a heuristic. Only count the face cards. Only count the cards in the suit that's bad because you're playing a trick-taking game and you don't want to take this particular suit. Keep a soft count. Right, you try to memorize every card in the deck. It's like, maybe some genius can do that, but no, I, I cannot. Like Tigger's and Euphrates or Yellow and Yangtze. I don't count every victory point anyone got. I just remember what everyone is low in. Scott's low in blue. My friend Joey Jojo is low in green. Right, That's I see Rim I win an external conflict. He's got 20 red points. And I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not going to have to remember. But Rim has 25. It's just like, Rim has a ton of red points. He definitely doesn't need red. Oh, Rim wants to score some red points? I'll let him have that red monument. I don't care. Right? A lot of times, directional heuristics can come down to a simple if this, then that decision. For example, if I don't want to be made fun of, I will never wear that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but has anyone played the game of Euchre? Yeah, the people well, back there get excited so, every time you mention Euchre. All I'm going to say is, Bauer, <laughs> this is a trick-taking game where like, to make something trump in the game, you have to pick up a card in that suit. So. A pretty good heuristic in the game of Euchre is if you see a Bower, which is the strongest possible trump card in the game, if you see it sitting there, always pick it up no matter what. If I see a Bower, I will pick it up. It's not the best strategy, but it's way better than random. It's way it's, better than just always letting someone else take the Bower. And it took me zero seconds to make that decision because I came into this game saying, I'm wearing this shirt and if I see a Bower, I'm picking it up. How about risk? Heuristics can get pretty complex. I actually have pretty complex heuristics for some games. Risk has actually a very simple model you can follow to give yourself the best possible chance of winning risk. That's why we don't play risk. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You can go look this up on your own. But uh, there's a pretty simple model. If you just memorize this black line here, you can win risk way more often than your friends. Right. It's still a game of luck. It's a game of dice. So even if you follow that line, you're going to lose sometimes when the dice are not in your favor, right? You know, the die is cast. But if your friends aren't following the line, your chances of winning are very, very high. You'll win like 70, 80% of risks against people not following the line. If everyone's following the line, just roll a d6, see who rolled highest, and go home. And the way, the way you develop these heuristics sometimes is just to, if you don't understand the game, just start doing stuff. And if some stuff you did did okay in a game, start doing that instead of whatever you were going to do before, and then start looking for what could you do better. Narrow the scope of what you're looking at with a heuristic, and then try to make a better heuristic among the remaining options. Right, like I have a heuristic for playing power grid that I use to determine how much will I bid in the auction for power plants, right? And I developed it over the course of several plays of Power Grid. It's kind of complicated. It's not so simple. It's like a list of rules I go through in my mind, and I'm like, will I bid up or will I pass? All right? But I had to build that. It's not written anywhere. You can't learn it online. Maybe I'll do a video about it, but that's not today. The more complex a game gets, the bigger a game gets, the more the heuristics become more like the things you do to decide things in your real life. Because you are not calculating most of your interactions in the world. You're not thinking about how much foot pressure you put down step by step. You're using heuristics already. It's what you're good at as a human. So if you play really complex games and try to use the kinds of heuristics you would use in your real life, You'll get better at both games and real life. 
Like in Quartermaster General, I have heuristics like if the southern coast of Europe looks weak, Italy should actually get really aggressive in the early game. I base that on reading a lot of World War II history books. <laughs> There's a concept in sports of fast and frugal heuristics. Because if you're playing ice hockey, I mean, your simple thing is, should I try to get the biscuit into the basket? Like, yes, always try to get the biscuit in the basket. Do it as much as possible. But you need more complex heuristics like, when should I shoot versus when should I pass? How do I figure that out? And in a game of hockey, you have half a second to make that decision. If you're playing Puerto Rico with us, you have half a second to make that decision. <laughs> you can actually Google fast and frugal heuristics and you'll find like a lot of studies and examples of heuristics. People write books and essays on applying these to real life. Like one of these here, the uh, recognition heuristic. If you see a bunch of options and you recognize one of them, and you don't recognize the other ones, pick the one you recognize. This happens a lot to me in new games, right? Like a new games, especially complicated ones, I don't understand all the options. There's like a, I see a bunch of symbols and it's like, well, I don't know how any of those, maybe you're learning Race of the Galaxy, you haven't learned all the symbols yet, but you remember the military rules, you learned how those work, and you see some military cards. Well, play the military cards. It may not be the best move, but it's the best move you can do because you don't understand the other ones. If you try the other ones, you're just gonna mess up because you don't know how they work yet. If you stick with the military one, the one you know, you'll do the best military you could do, which will be better than if you, maybe the other path had more potential for someone who knows what they're doing, but that ain't you, right? Yep. Not so now, at least. If you're really, like, if you find yourself, like, if you're one of the people, you don't have to, like, identify yourself where you're the one who takes a long time on your turn and you feel like you're bad again. Oh, we got one. <laughs> Honestly, find this Wikipedia page and start doing the things on this page no matter what the game is you're playing. You might not do better, but you'll play a lot faster and it'll help you get past like the hard, like early heuristics and you'll start to figure out better heuristics. Right. And remember how I talked about how I developed the power grid heuristic over several games. If you play fast, you can play more and develop your heuristic faster. If it takes you all day to play one game, you didn't develop much, did you? But if you played the game 10 times a day, you're gonna be really good at the end of the day. Right. So like Scott said, like, we're not joking. If you're not sure what to do, do something random because it's not the real world. If I do something random up here, I'm probably gonna put my pants or something. But if I do something random in a game, there's only so many options in a game. Right. There's only so many things I can like do in the rules of the game. All right, so the game we have pictured here is a game called Citadels. It's basically a complex version of which cup has the poison in it, oh, ha ha. <laughs> Right? So it's like, you look at the way the board is, and like, well, the best one for him to take would have been the merchant, because he has several green cards, and that would get him a lot of money. But he would never take the merchant, because he knows it, and I would assassinate the merchant to stop him from getting all that money. Well, Scott's wasted his time with all that. I just take the cards, I shuffle them behind my hands, I play one randomly, and I fold my hands and just look at him and wait. It's random. All your thought is meaningless now. Exactly. So I will also randomly pick one. <laughs> And there you go. We have now done the best possible move. You can't use a psychology on me if I didn't use psychology to make the decision in the first place. Scott, <laughs> Scott was the one who figured this out. We loved this game and one day Scott did that and I was like, oh, oh shit. And then I did it and everyone did it and we were like, well, this game's ruined. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not just that game that's ruined. The game, any random poison cup game has now been ruined for this entire crowd of people and YouTube. Cockroach poker, I'll play randomly most of the time. I'll be like, this is a cockroach, didn't even look at it. Here's the more sophisticated way. Here's the galaxy brain way. Well, one way, <laughs> shuffle your cards behind your hand, that, like pretend you're acting randomly, but don't actually act randomly. Ooh. But here's a better way. And this is much more important to going fast as opposed to winning. If you've eliminated all the stupid options and you've got a few options left, but you're not sure which one is better, don't waste your time trying to figure it out. You've already made a better decision than just acting purely randomly by narrowing down the odds. Right, so Rim has a bunch of blue cards, which means the bishop, you notice how it has a blue symbol under the five, that's why blue is, right? So Rim has a bunch of blue cards. The bishop is strong, assassin's always strong. Maybe thief is not a good choice. Maybe he's got thief in his hand. He could choose it, but there's no one to steal from, so it's a worthless card, right? You don't want to accidentally pick the thief randomly. Get that thief out of there, randomly choose between the bishop and the assassin. Now you're guaranteeing yourself a good move, but still 
still, no one else has a better than 50-50 shot of guessing your good move. In fact, they have a 33% chance shot of guessing because they might stupidly guess me. <laughs> so see how these build on each other. First, you try to eliminate bad ideas, and then you start to figure out which good ideas are better. Then you eliminate more bad ideas. Then you figure out better ideas that are better. And if you just keep going back and forth like this, you'll be really, really fast at games. If you're not sure what to do, look at whoever is sitting to your left and just do whatever it is they're doing. Right, so most games go clockwise, not Illuminati. Illuminati goes counterclockwise, in which case do what the player to your right is doing. Thank you, Steve Jackson. Yes. So, in games, there's usually like resources, right? Like, I'm going green, I'm going blue, I'm going yellow, right? But if a game is clockwise and you do what the person to your left is doing, you're going to get all of, like, your rim's doing yellow. I'm to rim's right, he's to my left. I go first, I do yellow. Hey, I needed that. Why are you taking my yellow? I'll get all the first good picks at yellow stuff, except for when Rim's the first player, and the rest of the game, when Rim is not the first player, I'll get the first pick on all the yellow stuff, and all these other people aren't doing yellow, they don't care, right? Rim now wants to, right, do what the player to his left is doing, and so forth. But there's a point at which you can't really change, because you've sort of already gone all in on a certain road. Yep. Right? So look at the different paths to victory that the game has. This gives you victory points, that gives you victory points, and that gives you victory points. Pick the road to victory points that the player to your left is doing, if it's a clockwise kind of game, and you'll steal all that good victory points before they get them and they're screwed. Now your chance of winning is increased by one over the number of players percent. Now even better, if you're playing with a game, it looks like one person just like knows what they're doing, is doing really well, just do exactly what they're doing. They'll beat you in, uh, there's, there's a concept in war, like war war, like real fighting war, of defeat in detail, and that person will defeat you in detail. If we're playing Puerto Rico, and you just copy what I'm doing, yeah, you'll come in second place, and we'll, you'll do really well, but I'll beat you by a little bit because I know all the subtle nuances of my complex galaxy brain strategy. But if you want to learn how to get good at a game, figure out who's really good at the game at the table and do what they're doing anyway to learn the ropes of that strategy. Right, if you're playing like a collectible card game, for example, right, and you may not want to play the decks the pros are playing, right, but you should, even if you don't bring that deck to the tournament as your deck, you should play all of those decks, understand how they work, understand how to beat them, see what the frustrations are when you're playing as them, and then when you're playing against them, now you know what the frustrations are, you can exploit them. Like even Overwatch, video games. I play a lot of Overwatch. I'm really bad at Genji. I play Genji a lot in the arcade just to understand what it's like to be a Genji. <laughs> now, I'm literal here. There's an old game called Yahtzee. Just play it a lot and get good at it. Yahtzee. If you get good at Yahtzee, you get good at the world. <laughs> Yahtzee will teach you so many fundamental calculation skills, odd skills, dice skills. You'll learn a lot in a hurry. And you can play it solo, so if you're slow, you won't torture anybody. And in fact, there's an app on, I hope it's still around, there used to be a website you could go to where you would just play Yahtzee on this website over and over and over again. Solo Yahtzee for free, just play it and roll the dice for you, it's super fast. And after every game, it would tell you how close to mathematical perfection are you playing. Right, because it would look at your roles, and then it would have another computer, right? It would have the AI, whatever, that's perfect, that's mathematically perfect at Yahtzee, play the same dice you got, and then it would make its decisions and compare your score sheets. Now, this expands into just sub-games in general. A lot of games have a game, but there's little sub-games. Like, there's a trick-taking component of this game. There's a Yahtzee component of this game. Right, you're there's playing this big game, but actually this part of the game is just a <laughs> spiel. This part of the game is actually just a drafting game. Yeah, you sit down with us, like we sit down at any new table, and we'll literally be like, oh, this is just a Colonel Blotto with Settler's Placement. I see what's going on here, and I already have heuristics for those sub-games. So I don't have to worry about the sub-games now. I can focus on what the output of those sub-games is in the broader game. It's like when you exercise, and you exercise one particular muscle. That muscle's generally useful in the rest of your life now. Just don't over-exercise that one muscle. <laughs> Seriously, guys, like, we gotta talk about this. People don't know how to play games. People read the rules and still don't know how to play games. People say they love a game and have played it 10 times and don't know how to play it. If you wanna be fast at a game, you have to know how to play it. You have to memorize eventually, not immediately, right? But at least the basic rules, the basic structure of the game, you better be 
damn sure about it, right? And then when you play, you don't have to stop to constantly read the rules. You might have to look up a card here and there, or a special edge case. That's perfectly acceptable when you're new to a game. When you've played a game a zillion times, now you better know all those cards and edge cases just by sight. And when you've mastered the rules, even the edge case rules, you can play very speedily as long as everyone at the table is equally experienced because you don't need to reference rules, you don't need to stop, you don't need to ask questions. That stuff all takes time and slows the game down. Now, there's a subtlety here because something new has come up. A lot of games have an app now. The apps are great, and they're a great way to learn a game because you're not going to annoy anyone when you're sitting in the bathroom and you're playing Race for the Galaxy on your phone. I can play Carcassonne and like, two Carcassonne in like one poop. It's like amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but if you learn to play a game on an app and you don't play it in real life often or you've never played it in real life or you don't really like look at the rules in real life, you won't know how to set it up. You won't know a lot of the like busy work within the game and a lot of the rituals within the right, game. Right, like when I play Carcassonne in the app, there's a little helper that says, can't put tile here, can put tile here. Oh, by the way, the tile that could go in this spot is nowhere left in the deck. You don't even have to memorize the tiles that have been drawn or, right? But in real Carcassonne, you're sitting looking at a table. It's like, you have to look and know how many tiles of that are in the stack total. Are they all visible? You have to track that stuff in your mind. You have not practiced doing it at all because you only played on the app. And now in real life, we're having a problem. Yep. And you don't know how to set the game up. You don't know how to tear the game down. You don't know how many chits to put on the grognard part of the war game in Sector 7B. So you've got to actually know how to play the game in the physical world unless you're only ever going to play it in the app. Only playing in the app is perfectly fine. We talked before about games that are too slow because it's too much busy work out in the real world <laughs> version of the game. And an app would speed it up to make it instant, right? But it goes both ways. If you've only played the app, your real world play is going to slow down to a crawl. So some games, if the game has a lot of busy work, like our friend Chris, we love these train games. I don't know how to do half the busy work in that game. Chris just does it for me. If you have a friend who will do all the busy work in a complicated game to help everyone else play it, cling to them you for the rest must, of your life. You also must thank and appreciate this friend who is doing selfless labor, basically being a human computer for your service. Right? They're like, yes, I will make this game easy for you to play by taking care of all the bullshit for you quickly because I'm the one who memorized it and you don't have to know it. Right? Thank this person and do not let them go. So there's our friend Scott Johnson again, but here Scott Johnson is doing something very clever. So our friend Matt is taking his turn. Look what he's doing. He's looking at what's going on. He's planning. When it's not your turn, try to decide what you're going to do when it is your turn. Don't just immediately look at Twitter like most of you do in every game when even a second passes where you're not taking your turn. Now, sometimes it could be the game's fault, right? Where so much changes on each player's turn that you can't even begin to think about what to do on your turn until every player is done because the, you have, you, everything will change, right? And that's the game's fault. But sometimes not a whole lot changes between your turn and your next turn. Yep. It's like playing Ticket to Ride. Yeah, I'm going to build that route and that route and that route. And if that one gets blocked, I'll build this other way. Or like, I don't care what they're all doing. I can ignore the game when it comes around to my turn. I've already planned my turn three turns ago. I just boom, there I go. Yep, I don't care what they're all doing. I got a tank. I'm going to use it on my turn. As an aside, our friend Scott Johnson, right, because he's here. Uh, I just want to point out that he looks exactly like the two of humans in the game Wizard. <laughs> so... This is also a problem. I've noticed a lot of you out there, the royal you, will get a game, play it once, never play it again. Kickstart a new game, play it once, never play it again. You can't get fast at games unless you play them more than once. This game is up on the slide because we have played it nuns. <laughs> I and love I believe, this game. I believe everyone on Earth has also played it nuns. <laughs> we all kickstarted this game. It's a good game, but I just... Is it? You've never played it? How do you... I played it in an app. Did you? Yes. Are you There's lying? an app. Okay. It's a pretty simple war game, but I just haven't played it. But if you play a game more than once, you'll get faster at it. We've played Puerto Rico hundreds of times because one summer we played it three times a day. And I'm looking at you, people who played like Munchkin, Arkham Horror... Play more than one game. Right. Even if you go down to that tabletop free play, which you're going to have, like, I guess, a couple more hours to do, unless you go to the Omegathon, right? Magic the when Gathering players in particular. Right. When you see some games that look unfamiliar to you, and maybe you won't like them, and you know what? Odds are you're right. You probably won't like them. But you should at least give them a shot. 
right? What does it take you? 30 minutes, an hour? You can always sit down and just leave. Be like, play the game and be like, you know what? It's not for me, but I learned something and then leave and you take something away. I've played so many games, most of which I haven't liked, but even the ones I don't like, I learned something and that helped me in other games because I think back to that game I didn't like and then I'm playing a new game and I'm like, oh, I don't like this game either. It's like that one I didn't like. Let's get out of here. <laughs> so here's the guy to the end of the panel. If you're stuck, like you don't know what to do in a game, like seriously, just do something. Just do something. Don't worry about it. You'll learn from failure. Right. If you see other players being aggravated, just do something. Just pick, pick one of the options that you had in front of you. Just do it right away. And if your friends are taking a long time on their term, there's a very easy solution to this. <laughs> I think we misattributed this quote to uh, Rainer Kinesia once, but I'm pretty sure it was Klaus Teuber who said it. I don't know. But it was basically an interview, and this game designer basically said, to the, the question was like, what do you do if the game takes too long? It's like, well, if my friends are taking too long, we start to chant, move or I will hit you. Move or I will hit you. <laughs> if your friends are taking too long on their turn, like, puff, 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 go, go, go. Like, put the pressure on. Use peer pressure and social pressure to make your friends take their turn faster. All right. Only metaphorically hit them. Yeah, don't actually physically hit them until you're outside of packs because the badge says don't hit people. <laughs> and also, if, a, if there's a game like Monopoly or Arkham Horror that takes way too long, that's a real version of the game they just released. If it takes too long... I don't think it's meant to be played. It's just like an art, artist kind Don't of play that game. There's a game called Fast Food Franchise. It's that same garbage game with the same amount of fun, but it ends when it ends. Just like this panel. I hope this was enjoyable. <laughs> If for some reason you don't like us, you have a complaint of some kind, come and get this flyer so when you complain to the enforcers about how bad we are, right, you, they will know who is bad and get the right people and kick us out of packs. And if you love us for some reason, I don't know, you can listen to us podcast for thousands of hours. You can, like, use that QR code or something. Also, come get this flyer. We will be posting video of this panel and video of many other panels on the YouTube channel. Sometime Monday, we will link to the slides from this panel as well as a bunch of other information. To make all your slow friends that we're not here at this panel. You can make them watch it. <laughs> and I urge you to go to the Omegathon finale at 5.30. I will see you there. Goodbye. I think everyone who plays Blue and Magic should go and listen to this. <laughs>